The following TGC production may not be rebroadcast or otherwise used without the expressed written consent of the Government Channel 16 and the City of Athens. Your local source for live meetings. The Government Channel presents... Welcome to Straightforward Conversation with Gary Hunter. My guest today is Bill Biddlestone, the Athens County Prosecuting Attorney. Bill has a Bachelor of Science degree from Ohio University and his law degree from Cleveland Marshall University in Cleveland. He was first elected Athens County Prosecutor in 1993. Bill is a member of the National District Attorneys Association and the Ohio Prosecuting Attorneys Association, and he's a past president of the Athens County Bar Association. Tonight's topic is the Athens County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. Good evening, Bill. Hi, Gary. Bill, I think uh, a lot of people are not aware that the county prosecutor is an elected position. Maybe some are and some aren't, but they probably also aren't really aware of what the basic responsibilities of, uh, are for that position. Could you just kind of give me a brief outline of, of um, what you are supposed to be doing in your office? The <clears throat> prosecuting attorney actually has two major areas of responsibility, uh, legal advisor for all the county elected officials, county school boards, um, and any other county boards or office holders, mm -hmm. um, as well as a criminal responsibility to prosecute all felony cases in Athens County. Those are the two major areas that we encompass. We also have two other kind of branch areas that are related to those. One is a victim assistance program, which uh, works with uh, victims of not only uh, felony crimes, but also misdemeanor crimes, and also our uh, Southeast Counties of Ohio Task Force, which is a, a law enforcement agency basically that just is funded through our office. What kind of staffing does your office have to, to um, handle all these multitude <coughs> of uh, responsibilities? We have altogether uh, 12 employees in the office, uh, four attorneys, uh, two investigators, two victim assistance people, and uh, four clerical staff. And of course, the next obvious question is how big a budget do you operate with? Our total budget for the office is, uh, it's gone through several changes this year, but it's roughly something in the area of three hundred dollars to $325,000. And of course, and the county provides us space, so we don't have to rent much space with that. And is, is, as I understand it, your position right now is classified as a part-time position, but it'll be going full-time here before too long, or that's in the works, or well, actually, what do you have to tell me about that? It, it, uh, up until this year, uh, there was no election. It was automatically a part-time position, which, which meant, in essence, that I could engage in the private practice of law as well as be the elected official. Um, in 1990, uh, uh, statute 1992 changed that so that we have the election now. We can elect to be full-time or part-time, uh, depending. Of course, I've elected to be full-time. I was full-time when I could have been part-time, so I've maintained a full-time status. Okay. Uh, I think the audience may be interested to know. I think we, when we watch television, we we, you know, we go to a, we see a crime after it's been committed, and we see a crime scene. A lot of times, we'll see the investigators there, and we might see a, a um, an attorney or a prosecuting attorney there. Could you just tell me, or, or the audience, briefly, when do you get involved with the crime? Is it normally at the crime scene, or is it some later date, or is it vary back depending on the kind of crime that's been committed? Generally, we get involved <clears throat> in the. Uh, crime after it's committed, obviously. Um, and generally, we receive a report. We're not at the crime scene at all. And um, if, it's a, if it's a serious crime, um, we will go to the crime scene in order to have that uh, familiarity with the situation, which will help us later in the prosecution process. Um, normally, though, we get reports <clears throat> after either after charges have been filed or when there's an investigation in progress and it's, our assistance is needed in uh, channeling the investigation in the right direction for an effective prosecution. Now, in your office differs from the city prosecutor's office in one respect. You actually have an investigator on staff that's able to do some for you. What, what function does he or she do for you? Our investigator 
provides a variety of of services. It's, it's they're really classified in the statute as a secret service officer, not as an as investigator. a secret service officer. Yeah. Um, so I always tell them they're supposed to stand in front of me if anybody shoots at me, but I've never <laughs> yeah. got a commitment for that yet. Um, their primary responsibilities in our office are they handle one of our investigators handles our diversion program, you know, which is uh, for nonviolent uh, theft offenses primarily, and monitors like probation officer for those people. Um, they also handle all our bad check cases. If there's a, a bad check over five hundred dollars that your office wouldn't handle, of course, it will come to our office. Um, they handle. By the way, we handle a lot more of those than you do. I think. Really. I'm sure you do. <laughs> there's a lot more under five hundred dollar bad checks than over. Fortunately, um, they handle our bad check investigation, and they also um, uh, review the reports that come in from the law enforcement agencies to make sure they're they're thorough and adequate for our purposes. Uh, make an initial review of those before it goes to a prosecutor. Are these these are not attorneys that are your investigators? No. No. What what kind of basic qualifications do uh, they have? Law enforcement it? law enforcement training. They're all qualified, certified law enforcement officers. So they work in in some cases. They work in conjunction with. Uh, Police officials, uh, police officers at a, at, at or a scene of a crime. We actually in, encourage uh, uh, officers to call us. We help assist with search warrants on a regular basis, um, and we'll actually write search warrants for officers. We have a computer program that assists us in doing that and make a nice, neat job of it. Um, and we uh, make arrangements to get the judge available to sign it if we're if that's assistance requested from us. So they're involved with the law enforcement officers a lot, and oftentimes at the initial point of investigation. You mentioned your diversion program, and I wanted you to kind of just briefly outline for the audience uh, what that program is, because as far as I know, that's a fairly new program that you've instituted since you've been in office. Right. It's about three years old now. Uh, the diversion program is a statutory authorized program um, that uh, allows certain kinds of offenses to be admitted to a process that actually diversion is that diverts them from the criminal justice system. Right. It's, uh, I really view it as a pretrial probation program and if they're successful in meeting their obligations under the program then the charges are never filed or their charges are dismissed at that point actually because charges are always filed initially before they're allowed to be admitted to the program it involves a commitment to a minimum of 10 hours a month uh, community service for the entire time they're in the program uh, the program would last between uh, uh, one and five years it involves making a, a firm agreement for restitution the victim, which is a primary component of that program, um, and any other services we believe that person might need, such as alcohol counseling or uh, mental health counseling or employment counseling or schooling uh, requirements uh, would be part of the, their responsibility. The advantage over diversion compared to probation, which normally these people would get if they were convicted of the offense they committed, right. is <clears throat> if they don't follow their agreement with us to make restitution, we can revoke them from the program under probation you can't do that and we can have them immediately taken back to court and be sentenced at that time for failing to follow any of the commitments they have to our office uh, as a result of the diversion program. What are, are there, I assume there are certain criteria to be eligible for a diversion program such as not having a, a long criminal record or is it only Actually, for first it's, offenders? It's generally first offenders. There, there, may, there have been times we've admitted somebody who had a prior juvenile offense or um, petty Real petty offense prior, but what if the, first uh, offenders are the. What if the victim strongly objects to a. The they're not admitted. <laughs> they're not admitted. <laughs> no, no. Um, generally, that's not the case because victims, especially these kind of theft offense kind of things, like a bad check or a welfare fraud or something along those lines, um, the victim wants their money back. Right. And this this program is the most effective way to get restitution from uh, potential defendants. Very interesting. Well, stay tuned. Bill and I will return after this uh, commercial break. Welcome back to Straightforward Conversation. My guest this evening is Bill Biddlestone, the Athens County Prosecuting Attorney. Bill, I think a lot of the members of the public probably aren't aware that you also deal with juveniles as, as the Athens County Prosecuting Attorney, and that's something that we as city attorneys and the city prosecutor's office don't handle as juvenile cases. Could you explain for the, uh, us a little bit about uh, what your involvement is with juveniles and what agencies you work with? Sure. There's two basic uh, areas of juvenile uh, right. law as well. One is the delinquency and unruly cases, which are virtually the criminal juvenile cases, and the ne abuse, neglect, and dependency cases, which are really civil uh, custody cases, actually. 
we have an assistant that works full time with Children's Services and is actually housed in the Children's Services complex um, and handles all of the abuse, neglect, and dependency cases for the county. We also have one of our assistants does um, our delinquency and unruly cases. Um, last year we had close to 700 delinquency and unruly filings in Athens. I guess county. I didn't realize you had that many in a year's time. It's, it's um, quite a large um, volume of cases go through. Um, now, what all would go into delinquency and unruly? Obviously, some sorts of assaults or those kind of things, but what Well, else? delinquency cases, of course, are criminal offenses. It would be a crime if committed by an adult. It was kind of conduct. It would be a crime if it was committed by an adult. Unruly cases are really status offenses that wouldn't be a crime except for the fact that they're juveniles. So running away from home, uh, being truant from school, uh, those are unruly uh, cases where uh, assault would be a delinquency case. Do you actually have a specific prosecutor that is, does juvenile work pretty much full Michael time? Michael Prisley does all of our juvenile cases in the Common Pleas Court, uh, the delinquency and the ruling cases. Uh, we have a new attorney at the Children's Services now, um, I'll think of her name in a second, uh, Kay Hines, who uh, is just starting with us doing all the uh, abuse, neglect, and dependency cases. And those are all handled uh, in what in the probate juvenile division of the Common Pleas Court, Correct. which is on the um, second, floor. second floor of the courthouse. Right, Judge Robes Court. Okay. And the other criminal cases are in, in the regular division of the Common Pleas Court, which would be Judges Goldsbury and Ward, right? Correct. Okay. Let's kind of, uh, I don't know that people are really aware of what, they hear the terms grand jury, pettit jury, but I don't know that people are really aware of what the distinction is between those. Can you kind of give me an outline of what uh, a grand jury is and what a pettit jury does. Well, of course, um, <clears throat> both of the, all the jury's structure is constitutionally based, or sure. people are required to have a, uh, entitled to a trial by jury. A pettit jury is a jury that would hear, actually hear a trial. Um, whether it's a municipal court jury or a common pleas jury, it's still con considered a pettit jury. The grand jury is also requires for felony cases, for serious criminal cases, and they're defined as felonies in Ohio and most places, um, before we can file a charge, before we can prosecute somebody for a felony case, it has to be presented to a grand jury, a group of citizens to determine that there's probable cause to believe the crime was committed and the defendant committed the crime. Um, the grand jury is uh, appointed for a four-month term. We have three terms of the grand jury a year, four-month period. In Athens County, we meet once a month. In larger counties, like Cuyahoga, they meet daily for uh, four months. Uh, fortunately, we don't meet once a month, generally one or two days a month. The selection process, I think, for the grand jury is uh, how many citizens serve on the grand jury at any given time versus the penitentiary? The, the grand jury panel for the four-month period it consists of about 35 individuals. There's 10 at each grand jury session, nine jurors and one alternate. Um, of course, in a regular jury in common pleas court, we have 12 jurors on a criminal case um, and uh, six in misdemeanor cases in the uh, civil court. cases, right. Uh, and what kind of concurrence of those 10 grand jurors does it take to get a, a true bill or an indictment out of the grand jury? There's only actually nine that vote. The one is the alternate, just in case uh, it's not chosen like a regular jury where you have voir dire and you test their... Because the defense counsel <clears throat> is not there. Either. There's no defense counsel there. Right. Um, but it takes seven of the nine voting jurors to uh, return a true bill or an indictment. And like you said, the grand jury process is really very one-sided. They only hear the evidence the state has to present, but we're only showing a very low standard of proof, and that is just probable cause, as merely it probably happened. Uh, and uh, it's a very low standard. They're just ensuring that nobody is charged uh, for malicious reasons is really what, what it boils down to. Walk me a little bit further along through the process. Uh, somebody is taken to the grand jury and there is an indictment or a true bill rendered. What happens at that point in time? After an indictment is returned, if an indictment is returned by the grand jury, then the person is served with a summons uh, or depending on the circumstances, perhaps a warrant for their arrest uh, based on the indictment. And then they're brought forward before the court for arraignment at that time. And what and is an arraignment? Arraignment is where they would come in and the court would ask them uh, whether they plead guilty or not guilty, like you see on TV, the basic process. Um, and bond is set at that time uh, to ensure their appearance at future proceedings. 
uh, and then the case is generally set for a trial date and a final pretrial date at that time, uh, which usually is a month or two months down, down the road. And then after a conviction is, is achieved in a case, do you participate further in the case as far as making recommendations on sentencing or reviewing for sentencing and following well, cases later? Well, as you're well aware, a great part of our job is to make recommendations on sentencing, what we think should happen with the case, and, and working with the victim, the officers, <clears throat> and of course the defense attorneys as well to come up with a, uh, an acceptable resolution to most criminal cases. Because in Athens County, for instance, we have uh, in the past couple of years indicted over 200 defendants each year, we couldn't possibly try all those cases. Um, so part of our, our job is to uh, work out a reasonable resolution that everybody is satisfied that the proper control is maintained over, over a particular defendant and that we would make that recommendation to the court at, at sentencing. And of course the court is under no obligation to follow our recommendations, but uh, probably 90% uh, of the time the court follows our recommendations. What's the is it, there are new provisions, I believe, out uh, in the law now. And it's, it's the truth in sentencing that's been referred to and so forth. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. And has it made much of a difference in Athens that you can tell? That's a, that's a very large topic. This is a voluminous uh, statute. I want the short 30-second version. <laughs> that pretty much totally revamped our criminal justice system in Ohio. Um, the high points of it, of it are that uh, no longer in, in felony sentencing um, is there credit for good time. Sir, virtually none. Um, it used to be a third of your sentence could be re your sentence could be reduced by a third if you just behaved yourself in when you went to prison. Um, that no longer is there. So now, if you get a 12-month sentence, you're going to serve virtually 12 months. There still is a small uh, one day per month of participation in a in a educational program that you can still get credit for, but that would mean in a. Um, and we still have shock probation. Well, it's not called shock probation anymore. Those judicial release, but there still would be shock, uh, in essence, shock probation. So uh, the, court, the court can go back at a later time and modify its original sentence. That's what the shock probation is. That's what the judicial release is now. They can review the case again uh, one time while the person's incarcerated and uh, modify their sentence and let them out on probation. Well, stay tuned. Bill and I'll return after this commercial break. When we come back, I want to ask Bill how he feels uh, about the new sentencing structure uh, that the state legislature has put in effect in Ohio. Welcome back to Straightforward Conversation. My guest this evening is Bill Biddlestone, the Athens County Prosecuting Attorney. Bill, before the break, we were winding up a short discussion on the, the truth in sentencing, if you will, uh, legislation that was passed. And it may be a little bit too soon at this point in time, but just generally your, your reaction to that uh, change in the law, do you think it's going to be pos have a positive effect on um, deterring crime in Athens County, or is it going to have just exactly maybe the opposite effect? It may have a neutral effect as far as deterring crime is concerned as well. It, it actually went into effect July 1st of last year, uh, so we've only had six months or so to work with it. Um, I think in, in dealing with victims, I think it's much, it, much very helpful in that regard, because now if you say to someone they got a 10-year sentence, it means 10 years. It doesn't mean six point uh, six years, four months, or something along those lines. Um, that was always hard for everybody to understand. How could that be, and how can we stop that from happening? Do you think it's um, an issue in plea bargaining? Would it be an issue in, in, uh, in negotiated trying to get settlements? Negotiated settlements, excuse me. I what? use the calm term. <laughs> um, the, the fact there's no good time? Correct? The time that's uh, a, the fact that a defendant instead of take being say I may take my chances and instead of getting five years in prison I probably only get one knows that he may well end up five years in jail if he doesn't uh, uh, acknowledge his and confess his crime. Actually another another compo as far as the hardest part uh, the biggest effect that might have in, 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 uh, in uh, negotiated settlements is the fact that now there's a, one of the new aspects of the law that we don't like as much is there's a presumption for fourth and fifth degree felonies that not to incarcerate there's a presumption to incarcerate first and second degree felonies. Um, so now a defendant on a fourth or fifth degree felony, if they realize they go to trial, there's still going to be a presumption against sending them to prison where they have to lose. Right. Um, we, we think it might increase the number of trials, actually, because settlements are unable to be reached. Um, that's the biggest, probably, change we're going to see over, over time 
in, in the new bill. Another aspect in your, your job that you mentioned earlier very briefly was the victim assistance program, and this is another piece to the overall puzzle, I think, of providing adequate um, uh, prosecution of cases. How, what is your office doing in that vein? I know you have a new victim assistance program that's what I think started under your administration. Or it actually certain? started prior. It was actually been ongoing in Athens County since I think 1988 or 89. Okay. Uh, Maura Goldfarb actually started the program. It was a first uh, advocate there. Um, the program has expanded considerably, I think, since uh, 93 when I started. Um, we re re requested and re received additional funding. We now have two advocates. Um, and actually, we're starting a third um, nighttime ride-along with the law enforcement program, a uh, person to ride along and explain victims' rights to victims at the scene of crimes. This is a very innovative uh, program that we're getting involved in. Um, the Victim Assistance Program primarily notifies victims and keeps them, in, keeps them informed of the criminal justice process to help them understand what's going on with the process, uh, to help us notify them of court hearing dates, um, to see if they need any assistance in getting to court, or if they need a place to stay when they, from out of town, they need a place to stay in town, to take care of their needs as they're involved in the criminal justice process. Um, to accompany them to court, especially young children need somebody with them for support and encouragement. Um, they provide a lot of uh, supportive kind of services to the victims. We've been talking almost exclusively in the show about the criminal side of, of aspects of your uh, job, which I think when people talk about the county prosecutor, they normally think about mm -hmm. criminal prosecutions. But I also quite aware that you also have a, a number of responsibilities on the civil side. And you might just outline some of those things that you do in the, uh, your responsibilities or whether you have <coughs> attorneys committed to that and what efforts you do in that area. We have one attorney in the office who does most, uh, mostly all our civil uh, and appellate work as, as well. One of the big aspects of her job is delinquent tax collection. And we work with the county auditor and county treasurer to collect delinquent real estate taxes. Um, that's a third, at least a third of her time is spent uh, uh, Bertie Peterson is the assistant doing that particular work. Mm -hmm. We also approve all contracts the county enters into for form, as to form to make sure it complies with uh, state statutes. Um, we're, we're also responsible for advising all the township trustees and we attend at least two township trustee meetings a year to uh, work with them and help them through the ever-increasing complexities of our legal system. How many townships are there in Athens? There's 14 okay. townships, so that's four officials in each township, that's a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of questions come from them. Um, there's also th three, three county school systems that we're, we are the statutory legal advisor for and, and the county board of education that we do respond in Beacon School, that we do respond to their requests for advice occasionally as well. Um, they generally hire outside counsel because of a very, very uh, specialized area of practice. Uh, but there are some personnel issues we get involved in, some funding issues we help them with as well. Um, we also advise all the elected officials on personnel matters, um, and have, have negotiated labor contracts. We get involved in every aspect of county government from the civil perspective as well. You advise the county commissioners, I believe, too, don't you? And, yes, the commissioners. Are, certainly, that's one right. of our main clients. Right, that's what I thought. You <laughs> you probably attend those meetings pretty frequently, don't you? Whenever we're requested to, we don't voluntarily. The, you, you have an interaction, I believe, too, with the Welfare Department? Well, the Department of Human Services is a part of the County Commissioner's Office. Okay. So we certainly work with them quite. I'm going to ask you, we have uh, just a short time left, maybe a minute or so, um, give you an opportunity to tell me what programs or plans you might have for the future for your office uh, that you think you're going to be working on. <clears throat> well, um, there's really nothing definite no definite programs planned. We really are, are uh, operating at a very high capacity right now. We're trying to maintain and streamline our operations. We're going to upgrade our computer system a little bit more, um, try to make the office more efficient, operate more effectively with what we've been doing. Very good. Thank you, Bill. This has been uh, this conversation with Bill Biddlestone, the Athens County Prosecuting Attorney. I'm Gary Hunter, and this is a straightforward conversation. Good evening.